Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our second webinar in our, our Kogat in the Classroom series. Um, we are so excited to have you join us today. Hopefully, you made our first session last week. Um, this is a series of webinars that we are running leading up to um, a really exciting resource launch um, in September for our educators and our parents and our teachers nationwide. So um, we are thrilled that you are here with us today. Um, today's topic is really understanding the Kogat ability profiles, um, understanding how your students um, learn best, understanding their cognitive strengths, and then providing um, or, or, or learning about some instructional recommendations that you can utilize in the classroom to really hone in on how your students learn um, and how to develop some of those cognitive strengths. Um, I am thrilled to be joined today by Adam Langingham, who I will let introduce himself shortly, um, who is an expert in, in understanding the COGAT, understanding student strengths, and really um, driving those strengths in the classroom. Um, before we get started, we are, um, you, we are really interested in hearing your questions throughout the session. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the, in the Q&A. You should see a panel on the side. Um, we will also be sending out some handouts following this webinar, so please stay tuned for a follow-up email where uh, we'll provide you some resources where you can put some of this into action. Um, and then finally, all of our webinar recordings can be found on info.riversideinsights.com backslash K12PD. Um, this is where we have all of our COGAT in the classroom webinar recordings, as well as previous here from your peers, previous here from the experts, um, and some of our other uh, webinars as well. So be sure to check out that page. Um, but without further ado, let's jump in. Um, Adam, we are so thrilled to have you join us today. Um, you are a really incredible partner of Riverside Insights um, and have quite a bit of experience in the field of education, specifically related to gifted education and social emotional uh, support for students. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to you if you don't mind introducing yourself. Sure, thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. And um, as Anna's been saying, I mean, I've worked with COGAT and gifted kids for many, many, many years. So just kind of my background, I got into education, seeing how students with potential just weren't really getting their needs met. And a lot of that came back to identification as I started to learn more about gifted and what was going on with some of the kids that I had been seeing in my classroom. And um, so it's just a great opportunity to work with Riverside. Um, I've worked with thousands of kids and parents over the years and just got back from the big thing annual conference supporting the emotional needs of gifted. And those of you who work with gifted kids know that that is a huge piece of how we support them. Um, so yeah, I am happy to be here and share what we've been doing. And I just wanna make a quick plug, Adam's two recent books, or he just had, I think, at least two books just come out um, that are all about twice exceptional children and how parents and teachers can support them. So um, really excited to, to um, have some more thought leadership in this space around twice, supporting twice exceptional learners. Thank you. Um, so, you know, last week, um, Dr. or maybe it was, I think it was two weeks ago now, Dr. Joni Lakin and I had a conversation on our first COGAT in the classroom webinar Kind of all about ability data, what ability data does, why ability data is important, what it, why it's different from achievement data. And one of the things that we were talking about was how it can actually be used in the classroom. Um, so believe it or not, the COGAT, Adam, I don't know if you, I know we've talked about this, but like the COGAT authors, the original COGAT authors, did not create COGAT to be a gifted identification tool. Um, they created it solely to be an instructional tool. Um, and to support teachers with really teaching and differentiating instruction for their students. Um, and over the years, it's become, you know, a really valuable asset for gift identification, but um, we're finding that more and more districts are, are trying to really use the information in the classroom for their students and are having a lot of success. So, I mean, Adam, from your perspective, you were an educator for decades. How, how can ability data really be used in the classroom, and I know we'll get into some more specifics in a minute, but where do you see the benefits of ability data in the classroom? I, just, I mean, as a teacher, I mean, great teachers get to know their students and then start to meet their needs. And in order to do that, one test or system really just doesn't do it all. So as a teacher, we're constantly you know, looking for how is, my student, how is this student doing? What do they need? And we 
need multiple data points and things to really get to know the whole child in order to support them. So this, the Quilgat system is a great tool to give you more pieces beyond just do they know how to multiply fractions right now? Those kinds of things that really, especially for gifted, but what's good for gifted is good for all. It kind of helps you fill in most of the pieces to get to know these kiddos. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that last point, even of understanding how you know students' achievement is discrepant or different from their their ability is really powerful and can help you identify like who are my kiddos where they're they're not achieving up to their potential um, quick plug we actually have a webinar coming up in a couple of weeks all about comparing ability and achievement data so be on the lookout for for that webinar to, to jump in um, so let's start with like what even is the ability profile I mean Adam from from your usage of of Kogat like what is the ability profile and and where is their value it's kind of this magic code for educators where is this, where is their value in this code um and um and what information is it really providing educators i mean the ability profile i mean it gives you so much data and information and what's nice about what we're working on and doing is to start flushing that out for the teachers to understand so i understand just moving into gifted education we have this test that's called the COGAT, you get these three scores. Well, that's great, but what more is to it? And when you really look, um, Riverside has done a great job putting a ton of information out there to help break apart these unique children. I mean, obviously, we can't drill down to the one child, but we can definitely start narrowing that focus to if the student's really strong in this area, but kind of struggles in this area. This is the data as you get into it to really start breaking it out. So it kind of, as my journey, you know, being a gifted teacher, then running the gifted program and running the testing system for identification, it's going from what is all of this to wow, there's all of this knowledge. How can we use it to help busy teachers in the classroom who may or may not have the background yet to just, you know, really get into it? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think so if you actually look at the ability profile code, um, this is, you know, an example of it, A, B, Q minus. What you're essentially getting here is three pieces of information for your learner. So the number is what we call the stainine. Um, on a scale, on a normal, you know, a normal bell curve distribution of one to nine, how strong are your students' cognitive reasoning abilities? Um, nine being they're really, really, really strong, you know, five or six, four to four to six being they're relatively average, and then one to two being they're on the they're on the lower end. Um, and so this is just giving you a perspective of how strong your student is able to critically reason and solve novel problems and talk, do some of the things that Dr. Lakin was talking about in our last webinar. That middle um, letter is either going to be an A, a B, a C, or an E. And what that middle letter is telling you is the pattern of your students' scores. So remember, if you remember um, from our last webinar, um, COGAT uh, provides information about a student's verbal, quantitative, and nonverbal reasoning. So three different um, areas of reasoning ability. And if a student has an A pattern, that means that verbal, nonverbal, and critical, and, um, and quantitative are all pretty consistent. If a student has a B pattern, that means that there's two of them are pretty consistent and one is either higher or lower. If a student has a C pattern, that means that there is typically a relative strength and a relative area of growth. And if your student has an E pattern, that means that there is an extreme difference between one of your students' um, uh, areas of reasoning and another area of reasoning. Um, oftentimes we find some of our twice exceptional students as these E profiles, where they are off the charts in a certain area um, and maybe relatively average in some of the others. And so this pattern provides you kind of an understanding of how your students' areas of reasoning balance each other or, or don't balance each other out. Um, and then the, finally, at the end of this code is we, we indicate whether your student does have a relative strength or a relative area of opportunity. Um, so 8CQ minus, for instance, is telling you that your student um, has an opportunity to develop their quantitative, quantitative reasoning skills. If this said Q plus, on the other hand, then it would tell you that your student has a relative strength in quantitative reasoning. Um, so there is a lot of information jam-packed in this ability profile, um, but 
the magic starts here because what what is I think so impactful is not necessarily the code, but what you can do with this information. Um, so I guess, Adam, like, what can you do with this information? As a teacher, how could you have incorporated or you know, how could you incorporate some of these reasoning strengths um, to really support your students in the classroom? Well, it, it, again, it's the data to get you to help that individual child. So if you know, you know, like starting out, we were just like, okay, this kid's gifted. Well, what, what does that mean? And where are they gifted? So many people think they need to be gifted in everything or things should come easy in everything. And those of us who've been in gifted know that is not the case. <laughs> we have these very complex children we're trying to support. And the data that we give here kind of gives you that kind of like reassurance. All right, you know, Susie sitting in front of me now is really high and verbal. She is going to be able to read and soak up that knowledge and do those kinds of things that we would probably stereotypically expect for someone gifted in that area. But this data also shows that maybe Susie or whoever is low in the quantitative. So that gives you that kind of, yes, we're not gifted at anything, everything. And here, as we're going to get into it, here's some things to work on, things to look for as, you know, COGET has really gone through and done the data over the years to get to know what really works for specific learning types and kids in these areas. So the data kind of flushes out more of a whole picture of that child in front of you. Can you give an example, Adam, like kind of from your experience leading, leading districts and districts, you know, what would some instructional recommendations be if you had a student who was a really strong quantitative reasoner? Well, quantitative is interesting because kids who do well quantitatively not only can go really in depth with that, you know, mathematical reasoning, but a lot of times they can move far faster through the curriculum. So when you're looking at setting up programs, when you have kids who are very high quantitatively and you're looking at setting up a math program, that's the piece that you look at and you need to understand that these kids, based on this data, really have that potential to excel and go in deep far beyond their other peers at that age level. So working with my teachers, it's especially for math, acceleration needs to be an option in there because these kids can learn multiple grade levels a year, some of them, if given that opportunity and we don't hold them back. So it's understanding this kid has this potential, what do we now need to do to keep moving and keeping them in that learning flow to keep them challenged but not frustrated? And when you're looking at them individually, if a kid, especially a kid who's twice exceptional, I've come across many kids who are amazing at math, but maybe they're dyslexic or they have some other issues with the verbal, they're still gifted. We still need to support them in that area of strength and then bring in other supports to help them on the sides for those other areas. And then what would you do, like, for example, if you had a student who, you know, these are some some instructional recommendations if you have a student who has an area of opportunity, but let's say you had a student who was a really strong verbal reasoner and maybe had an area of growth in quantitative reasoning. How could you combine some of that information um, in, in the classroom? So as you're working as a teacher and hopefully there's some gifted support staff there to help as well, as you're doing groups in the classroom, if someone is very strong verbally, again, maybe they're ready to do a more complex novel. When you start doing those Socratic discussions and things, you can tell those kind of kids typically have really thought, you know, well into it. They've absorbed a lot more and you can start grouping them accordingly. So if you're doing reading, you kind of bring these kids together, maybe do a literature study or a novel study and let them collaborate and really go in depth. And when like maybe in another area, they might be in another group. So maybe they're lower in the quantitative. They might just need a bit more practice than what someone stereotypically would say, oh, it's a gifted kid, they don't need it. Well, in math they do, and that's fine. But in a classroom, it's getting to know your students, breaking them up within the classroom or with outside support based on their need. But this system shows you both, which is what's nice. Yeah, and it provides a lot of great, I think, um, recommendations for even if your student is a really strong verbal reasoner, for instance, maybe you have your student 
talk everything out loud or write mm-hmm. stories about different things or you know how can you really think about how to lean into your students area of strength and area of reasoning um, and support them with their development in other in other subjects as well um, so Adam, you and your team have been, and a group of educators have been hard at work. Um, you guys have been taking um, some of our, some of Riverside's instructional recommendations for co-guidability profiles and really honing in on specific and actionable strategies that this, that, that, that each profile, um, specific and actionable strategies to, to support students of different profiles. So tell us, like, what have you all been up to and, you know, how have you kind of gone through this process of really thinking about what each profile, what each, what each student profile really, um, how to support each student profile in the classroom? Yeah. Um, so this, my team, we're current former educators. We've been in gifted, served multiple, you know, areas of giftedness, grade levels and things. And we kind of came at this kind of task with as an educator in the educator in the room, what would have helped us to get us kind of started? So like, like I told you in my situation, I was just kind of thrown in. Here's this test. Here's these kids. Go do it. And it was like, okay, at that time, where can I get information to help these students in my room? Because again, with everything going on these days, not everyone's getting that education and background knowledge of an educator and that support needed. But we need to step in and help these kids. So we came up, kind of came out at a frame of mind as like, okay, I'm a busy teacher. I now am the gift, gifted cluster teacher, or I know I've got gifted kids in my room. Where can I get data? Well, Coke at Riverside gives us the data once we know. Um, but what you guys had as Riverside, and I should say we, it was a lot of information. So once you're able to find those profiles on the website, it was just like, wow, okay, how do I digest this? And as a busy teacher, I'm just telling you, I know a lot, it just won't, (laughs) they won't be able to. Um, So how can we take that great information and boil it down to one page of, here's a great starting point for this child. And as you see on the screen, we broke it up into, uh, into different categories. And we have that tough balance of how much information can we get in there to help, but not be overwhelming and still be able to read it. So as you see, we've taken information that COGET had and applied some strategies and things that we as educators uh, know help these kind of kiddos and kind of gave you that one uh, template or um, table for each child. So hopefully as your, your kids come back and you see there's COGET scores, there's a table for each individual child narrowing down how you can help service them as well as some things to kind of look out for because again, some of these kids might have some weaknesses and we need to be aware of that. Once they hit that struggle, we need to know that we are gonna be able to support them. So it, I'll just kind of walk through this. So we just give a little overview at the top, like kind of where does this kid rank overall as far as the whole population? And then we go into their strengths. So if you have a child with this profile, the 8C N plus Q minus, right? It tells you this is where they're most likely gonna excel they have this potential in their typical areas of strength. So this kiddo, again, above average reasoning abilities, they're gonna be able to really get through that curriculum probably, and they're gonna do well in groups. Now again, doesn't mean guaranteed, but most likely this is what you're looking at for a strength. Then we tell you how do they learn best. So this one, again, this is a pretty high kiddo. They're gonna need some meaning in their learning. They're gonna need to understand that. Um, but they are going to have to do some extra practice and things, particularly in math. And that kind of comes up in the areas of potential challenge. So again, we're looking at the whole child. Okay. And here it gives some areas that, hmm, okay, yes, they're gifted, but these are the areas that they're not going to do their best. And as a teacher, as I'm setting up my classroom, building that environment, working in groups, it kind of starts telling me where I'm probably going to need to support this kiddo a bit more. Um, and then the bigger chunk, uh, which we had a hard time fitting everything in on all of these, is some strategies to help teachers in the classroom. What are some quick things, especially if I'm a newer teacher or just got a group of gifted kids in my class and I haven't been able to get trained yet? 
what are some quick and easy things I can do now just to start that differentiation and start supporting them. So if you see on, on this side under strategies to support these learners, th there's a lot of different things that you can do. Um, and again, depending on the learner, these change, sometimes they're similar, um, but we, we do end this list. And again, it was that kind of what's the good information? There's so much more, but these are the top things we would do for a kiddo in our class. At the end, we do have those questions then. So as you're looking at kind of Bloom's taxonomy and those higher level thinking skills, what are some quick stems if I'm doing discussions with these kids and things to either keep them at that high level or start that range of support with different questioning skills? So again, this isn't meant to be like the be all and end all. And if you're you know, an amazing gifted teacher with tons of years, you probably know a lot of this already. But for those of us who are new or just kind of need to focus a bit more on individual groups and kiddos, we're giving you that starting point, and then hopefully you keep building on your toolbox. And I think the powerful, I mean, this is incredible information. And when I was a teacher, I wish I had been able to really understand, um, okay, my student learns best in this, in, this, in this way, and these are some instructional strategies that I can leverage to really um, engage with that strength in the classroom. Um, what I think is really powerful is that this helps teachers use this information even beyond gifted as well. Like if you are a school that is using COGAT as a universal screener for gifted identification, that's awesome. But then make sure that your teachers are getting this information because that is valuable data that will help gen ed and gifted teachers really um, push all students forward. Um, similarly, I think that this kind of helps you really understand, um, you know, how, how your students learn. Even if you have to write like an IEP for a student, this is information that could be incorporated into that IEP. You know, this is information that could be incorporated into tier two instruction or differentiation or tier three instruction. And so um, there is so much meat in this ability profile. And the great thing is that each student has their very own set of instructional recommendations. And it's nice that it almost kind of makes an IEP for you, dare I say, for every kiddo. I mean, it's not just one math test or anything like that. It's every kid who, kid, child who takes the COGAT will get this report, regardless if they're gifted or not, which is a good point, because I always come at it gifted, gifted lens. But any child who takes this will have meaningful data to support them in the classroom and even at home. So hopefully these are shared with families as well. Um, so, as, so parents can better understand how their child can and should be learning in school and those areas of challenge that they're going to face most likely based on their learning profile. I'm giving you a couple of questions in the chat just about, you know, where do we find this information? Um, how do we get this information? Um, so just to be um, really clear, I should have said this a, a couple minutes ago, um, the ability profile magic code, if you will, is only going to, you're only gonna get that information if your students are taking the composite, the COGAT composite, where they're actually taking the verbal, quantitative, and nonverbal batteries. So those three batteries are coming together to create this, this magic code. Um, those ability profile codes live in the uh, data manager dashboard. Um, and so when you log in to get your student scores, you'll be able to see what your student's ability profiles are. Um, and then I will show you um, where to go to get some of this more like instructional recommendation information in just a minute. Um, but your, all of your students, if they're taking the COGAC composite, should have an ability profile. And um, we really recommend that all of your teachers get that information so that they can support their students in the classroom. Um, Adam, how does this even, when you think about, you know, you have a lot of expertise and specialty in supporting, you know, social, emotional, and like just student well-being in general. When you teach to a student strength or, or, or teach them in a way where they learn best, how does that really enhance the student well-being in the classroom? Oh, it, it, I would say everything, but that is a major chunk of how to keep kids motivated and engaged in school. And I think that's just becoming more and more apparent and powerful as the situation in education right now and our young people and what they've gone through the past few years. We really need to look at the whole child 
look at their social and emotional well-being because if they're not comfortable, if they're going through a trauma or something like that, the academic is not going to be important to them at that time. And I would argue it probably shouldn't be. They're going to need to work through things. And building that safe environment where the students feel comfortable is your first step in your classroom. Then building those relationships. Once you start with both you and your students and then as a class, but then understanding all of the facets of them. What areas are they struggling in? What areas are they going to need to see strength? And like I'm typically focusing on the extreme. So my latest books were twice exceptionalism. And one of the big pieces we talk about that is just so important, those two main pieces, is understanding the whole child. Strengths, weaknesses, everything. But also making sure they have those strengths honored in school. They have that opportunity. If they can excel in math, they need to be able to do it. it it's going to be, their interests are going to be what they live for in school and keeps them going. Um, and that just kind of goes back to my first year of teaching. I was a middle school teacher and I was pulling kids out. That was my role for Title I reading and they pulling them out of their elective classes. And it's like pulling them out of the arts and the PE and music for the class they chose to do more remediation is just, even as a first year teacher, I was like, this is not, not <laughs> what I would choose to do. But we need to make sure that when we're seeing the whole child, they have those opportunities for that strength to keep them going and motivated. Because if we were doing something we were not good at and struggled all day long and had no area to shine, would we want to keep doing whatever that was? We wouldn't. So what I like about these profiles and things is that we're giving you a lot more data and information on these kids that shows you the whole picture and kind of gets you thinking about as I'm looking at each child, Hopefully each day there's something that this child got to excel at and enjoy and really grow, as well as all of those things we needed to do to help pump them up and keep them going that they struggle in. Yeah, I think that's spot on. And one of the things I've been thinking about a lot too is that, I don't know about you, Adam, but I, it probably took me to be in, I mean, full transparency, my like, you know, at, till college to really understand what my natural strengths were. And to be able as a second grader to say, I'm really strong at quantitative reasoning, which means that when I'm writing, I really need to be able to use something like a template or an outline to organize my thoughts. Um, you know, mm -hmm. so I think just having that information at an earlier age means we're really setting our students up for whatever post high school looks like for them um, and, and really providing them with the self-awareness to, you know, really advocate for themselves and know their own personal um, areas of strength and areas of opportunity. Um, Absolutely, and it comes from just this. It comes from just this one battery. It's not testing the heck out of these kids on multiple things all the time. Which, yeah, don't get me started on testing in the classroom and everything. But <laughs> this gives you a nice, quick. These are the direction this kiddo's heading. Here's some tools and things to help. Yeah, absolutely. Which I would have loved. <laughs> I would have loved this. And I would, as I was telling Anna, I would have loved this for my teachers in my district. I just as we were going through building these, I'm like, what would I would have wanted? What would I want my teachers to have? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a couple more questions are coming in in the chat. Um, what grades do we recommend administering COGAT? That is a great question. It is not an assessment that we recommend administering every year. That's amazing, right? I know you're already giving so many assessments. <laughs> Um, because this, because COGAT is measuring your student's ability, ability doesn't uh, um, doesn't change as rapidly as achievement does. Um, ability does change over time as your students are exposed to more experiences and and are taught strategies to navigate some new problems. But um, we actually recommend only giving COGAT every two to three years. Um, so we recommend giving it once in like first or second grade. And then another time maybe in fourth or fifth grade, and then another time maybe in seventh or eighth grade. Um, so we recommend probably giving it about two to three times throughout elementary and middle school um, at some of those key transitional points um, so that your students, uh, you have a, a pulse on your students' ability. Um, where we, um, the other question that's coming in the chat is, can you kind of help interpret this, this the, the numbers and symbols up here? So in plus is essentially telling you that this student has a strength, a relative strength in nonverbal reasoning. 
Q minus is essentially telling you that your student has a relative area of growth in quantitative reasoning. That does not compare, that does not mean that, you know, relative to their peers, they have a relative growth or area of growth in quantitative reasoning. That means for this particular student, that student is stronger in nonverbal reasoning um, and could use their nonverbal reasoning ability to support what some of their quantitative reasoning needs. For example, this student in particular might be really good at drawing out figures and matrices and making pictures. And so as a teacher, what I would do is push the student to draw an image for every math problem that they're solving. So how can they tap into their area of strength um, and to support their area of opportunity? Um, just got another question about, would it be appropriate to administer this to ninth graders? Absolutely. This sets you up for really understanding how to help them succeed in, in high school. That is an awesome, I would, I would highly recommend administering it in eighth grade or in ninth grade, um, because that's a key transitional point for your student. And share it, and making sure to share it with the student and making sure they have it and can look at it. Um, I would also, to go back to the first question, just my kind of administrative gifted advocate hat. If you're using COGAT, I recommend using the COGAT, just as Anna uh, explained, every couple years or so as da data collection to see how this kiddo is doing. I would be really careful to make sure you educate your your site and administrators and things not to use it as a gatekeeper to then remove students from services. Um, in my experience, I've seen that, oh, the student retook the COGAT and went down a point or two in whatever they need to come out of the program. Uh, no, they don't. Um, it, it just means that maybe some other areas were growing or that kind of thing. But I would hesitate using it as a tool gatekeeping to remove kids from programs. It's a great tool to help you place students into programs. And I'll be honest, this was one tool we used as we started getting to know our populations and things that was the primary tool for gift identification. But there are other factors as we look at the whole child. And I would really refrain from using this as a retest to see if kids can stay in a program or use it to remove a child from a program, it, it's a data point and we need to look at performance and those kinds of things as well. But yes, it's a great tool to have multiple times throughout the school, the student's school career so we can better get information to help them. Absolutely. Um, no, this is all so exciting. Um, for those of you who are pinging in the, in the Q&A and you're interested in exploring opportunities with COGAP, please reach out. We'd love to have conversations with you about how we could best support your, your district or your, your school's program. Um, I know that there's a lot of excitement and interest around some of these instructional recommendations and how to support student strengths. Um, so we really wanna make sure, you know, I, I fully believe that we're, that there's an opportunity to leverage some of these instructional recommendations to make up the classroom a more positive environment for all students by honing them on their strengths and then teaching them using their strengths. Um, so believe it or not, we are quickly running out of time, but I wanted to plug that um, in September of this year, so right after school starts again, we are launching an entire suite of resources on www.cogat.com. And on this website, you will be able to go in and identify whether you are a district administrator whether you are a teacher or whether you are a parent. And you will be given an entire suite of resources directed to that specific role. Um, you will also be able to go in and click on what we're calling the Ability Profile Finder, where you will be able to get these instructional recommendations that Adam and his team have been crafting over the past couple of months. So you'll be able to take your student's Ability Profile score, go to cogat.com and enter that score and then receive personalized instructional recommendations for that student. Um, so we are absolutely ecstatic to launch this suite of resources in September. Um, and we, we really think that, you know, the resources we're putting out there for district leaders, for teachers, and for parents are going to help you use this information um, to support all learners in the classroom and make the classroom just a much happier, strengths-based place to be. Um, so Stay tuned for more information about Kogat.com, which is coming out in September of this year. Um, and then one last quick plug before we close it out. We have 
about eight more COGA in the classroom webinars coming up um, with our next one this Thursday. So this Thursday, we will be joined by Monica Simons and um, Marla Cabanis French, who are two um, incredible COGAP power users in the country. One's in Colorado, one's in Texas, and they're going to be talking about actually practically how they've implemented some of these instructional recommendations in the classroom and how they've supported their teachers with understanding how each student learns best. Um, so they are coming to share their success stories in Richardson ISD and in Jeffco um, uh, School District. And so we really hope you're able to join. Um, all of our webinars can be found on our COGA in the Classroom webinar series page, which we will email out again. Um, and we're really excited to continue the COGA in the Classroom conversation. Um, Adam, any closing thoughts? I know this, you know, 35 minutes flew by really quickly. <laughs> Yeah, no, and uh, I'm just um, hoping that this tool will definitely help kick off your teachers. And again, I was focused on like the gifted, but again, how this is going to be something meaningful for every teacher to have for the, all the students in their room. And again, just to get going into that differentiation space and setting up those relationships, that's so important. And even though it's so important, it's so hard to do. This gives you just a nice starting point. So, we're hoping it helps a lot of people out there. Awesome. Um, well, Adam, thank you so much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure hosting you on a webinar. Um, and with that, I will close this out. We really appreciate um, everyone taking some time to spend with us to learn about the ability profiles. Reach out if you have any questions or if we can support you with um, building, you know, or implementing best practices in your district. Um, and we look forward to seeing you hopefully on Thursday for our next Cogat in the Classroom webinar. Um, with that, have a great afternoon, everybody. Take care.